Yes, it's Old Home Week and everybody's visiting. Old bones don't heal. I'm I'm not even t- I'm not going there. I'm not touching that one. I will I will say I do realize I am getting older. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, was it Carol Carol Burnett or Tim Conway? One of them had a character that was always walking around like this. I may it may have been it may have been both Carol Burnett and Tim Conway. But oh, what was that, Mrs. Wiggins? Mrs. Wiggins, come in here. Okay, so we are in session seven, day two. Um, we talked last time about the uh, transfiguration. Now moving on in Second Peter chapter one. Uh, and so the the verse for the, the verses we're going to be studying for day two, and we'll have other verses come in. But it's 2 Peter 1, verses 12 to 15. And I'm going to read those. Um, I think Karen put the sheet out online if you want the session 7. Um, if, you, if you're if you in-house here and you need a copy of the Bible sheets, they're right up here. I'll bring you one. But verses 12 to 15. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, Though you know and are established in the present truth, yet I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir up, stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things. I got sound on. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm seeing sound on there, so, okay. Karen just came in and questioned whether my sound is on. That would never even be a question. There is no sound mind where I'm concerned. Way to go, Lois. I feel, I feel so loved in this room. Anyway, so the, the first question, why do we need to be reminded of biblical truths even though we already know them? Why do we need to be reminded? It's human nature and we lose our perspective. Um, but but he's saying we already know them so it's, we've had that repetition and we we've we've learned them and we've internalized them and they've become part of us now what was that number i just said all right but but see that's a simple number five thousand three hundred ninety two and as we look at everything going on in life, you know, things come flying at us, and while that Bible truth may be part of us, and, and it may be something that we internalized and, and learned a long time ago, when, when those bright lights and that loud noise of the world come in, the tragedies, the hardships, the tribulations, could we forget? As we start thinking about all the things going on, do we forget that number? What's that number again? You're good. 5,392. Don't ask me where I pulled that number from. But, um, and I'll ask you next week what that number was, by the way. No, you're not allowed to write it down. You're not allowed to write it down. That's, you're supposed to remember it. The whole point of... Well, see, and that, 
But see, why do you, why do you write it down? So you can remind yourself of it. I have found, and, and I always found in, in class, if, if I was listening to a lecture, that was fine. But if I listened and I wrote stuff down, I was much more likely to remember because the act of seeing it written, hearing it spoken, it became much more internal and much more memorized. Uh, not that that did much good for my test, but whatever. But see, y'all know I have ADHD, right? And, and so at times, I'll be talking to you and I'll go, oh, squirrel. It happens. Believe me, it happens. Um, and I think that's a picture of what happens to us spiritually. Spiritually, we're attention deficit disorder. You know, we, when, when the Bible is being read to us, and I didn't bring my Bible out here. I'm going to grab one of these. When, we, when the Bible is being read to us, boy, it, it, it's there. We're, we're good. We put that Bible away. By the way, we... we um, Mr. Head Elder, I, I see something we really need to take care of. Do you, do you see anything wrong with this Bible? I, I don't know, but it's, we have some mildew issues. So we need to, we need to look at our Bibles on, on this cart. Um, put that on our elders' notes. Either that or I'll put it on my ladies' aid notes. Um, but, I, yeah, I don't know why that, why that's so mildewed. I mean, the others aren't. Well, there's one more that is. Um, but, you know, the world is going to keep pounding at us, right? Uh, the lights, the noise, the trouble... And if we're not constantly reminded of those words of hope, those words of promise, we might forget them. You know, uh, and so I think spiritually, we sometimes are. Okay, Gideon. Um. That is weird, though, because I mean, none of the most of the Bibles are not, but there's two of them that are. The exact same Bible. So I don't, I don't understand what's going on there, but. We need to look into that. Um, but I think for Peter, and, and under, understand, he's writing at a time of persecution. And so there's a lot that could cause the Christian to forget about those words of hope. And, 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 and by the way, at that, at that point in time, do they have this? It's all verbal at this point in time. And so, what was it that Peter said? You know, what, was that that, what, what was it that Paul said to the Christians at Corinth? You, you, read, you read the letter to us a month ago. What was that again? Yes. On your heart, on your hand. By the way, it's why the phylacteries were used, where they would bind it on their, their wrist to control their actions, on their forehead to control their thoughts and upon their chest to control their, the, the, the desires of the body. Um, and it, depending on how important you were, you either had this little itty bitty box that you tied on that nobody really saw except you, or you had this big old gaudy thing that everybody could tell that you were being very scriptural and, and all of that. But yeah, it it becomes something that we need to be reminding ourselves of and then also reminding one another of. 
And I think for Peter, in a time of persecution, in a, in a time of deep and heavy tribulation, and there, there's, there's no easy way around it. You know, now I could tell you, and believe me, it's crossed my mind, it's crossed my desk a couple of times to send out, this week, concentrate on these five Bible verses. I've thought about it. But then I'm picking and choosing. So I just want to remind you, read your Bible. And, and, and by the way, you know my favorite Bible, Bible reading technique, right? You know, I, I just used this yesterday on somebody. You know, you don't have to have a reading plan. God's got one. What's God's reading plan? Open the book. Ooh, I get to read Hosea. Um, but you know, when, when you do that and you just let your eye fall and you just start reading, it's, it's amazing how the words will jump off the page at you. And see, and I think that's a way of reminding yourself of what God is saying. Yes, you could be one of these people that has stickers all along the edge of the Bible of places of different verses that you want to remember and that you want to read and all that. You could be one of those that colors the... I did, I did that to one Bible in my life. It was in college, and everybody was coloring their Bible, you know, blue for heavenly verses, green for life verses. Yeah, you had the dry, dry highlighters so that it wouldn't bleed through the page, and you would take and you, and you know what? After a while, it was kind of like, I can't read my Bible. It's too disturbing. You know, it, it, it's distracting. Um, so I've never done it to another, but... I do believe that God can put his reminder there for us when we open. The main thing is open your Bible. And, and you, can, you can start with Genesis and read all the way through. You can go out and get one of those chronological Bibles that puts every book in chronological order of where it is. I, I don't care. You could get... Uh, my dad had several different versions of the one-year Bible. And by the way, the one-year Bible, the thing I liked about it is each day you read a, you don't just start at Genesis and read so far and then, you know, you have some from the Old Testament, some from the New Testament, so you're, you're reading mixed throughout the year, or most of the one-year Bibles I've seen are. So you're, you're not just stuck in that Old Testament for three-quarters of the year. Or two thirds of the year. What? One year Bibles are good if you discipline yourself and do it. What happens though is January you're pretty good. February you start to slack off a little and so you catch up. March, you know, spring is coming around down here, so you got to get out and plant your flowers and stuff like that. And uh, although this year, March was pretty cold. Uh, and, and so, you, well, I'll catch up on that later. And pretty soon, in order to catch up, you got to do five pages a day, or five days worth every day, in order to get back on track, and you just give up. It might take you 10 years to go through the one-year Bible. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I, again, it, so many people, by the way, at what point do you lose interest in reading if you start with Genesis? What? Nope. Long before Psalms. You don't even make it to Deuteronomy. Most people, when you get into the genealogies, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he lived 110 years, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he lived to be a... And so-and-so begat... After a while, it's kind of like, do I really have to read all this? You know, and I think that's when a lot of people uh, get cut off. And what I always tell them is, if you're going to start at Genesis, when you hit the genealogy, just jump over it. 
you know, really when you get down to Genesis, it's, it is an action adventure. I mean, it, it is action-packed with uh, stories of life. Yeah, they throw the genealogies in there. Oh, and by the way, when you get to Leviticus and Numbers, yeah, it, it gets pretty boring too, and so skip those. Come back to them. Or, or tell yourself that you'll do a chapter of those a week. What? Why are there two Enochs? I don't want to go there. <laughs> you know, there there's, only so, there's, there's only so many names they've got, you know? Um, but we need to be reminded because there are, there are forces around us. Luther talks about the devil, the world, and our sinful self that don't want us to have hope. One of, the te- uh, one of the tenets or one of the things that communism and socialism so- sought to wipe out in society is religion, because religion gives hope, right? And if th- the, the whole hope of the person has to be on the government, not on any outside source. And so they would do away with family, put all the kids in the school, so they're controlling the education, they're controlling family, and then they would control religion. They'd control business and money too, but once you've got the education and the money, or the education and the religion, there is no hope. I'm not going there, okay? I'm, ta- I'm talking historically, like back in the 50s, okay? Uh, I'm not talking today. I'm, I'm talking back in the 50s. But you read the books, and by wiping out religion, you take all hope away. If you leave religion in society, there's always that outside hope. Um, it's, one of the, it's one of the things that Babylon did. When Babylon takes Israel away, yes, they destroyed the temple. Yes, they carried off all the articles of worship. But... What did they leave? They left religion in the people's lives. Yes, at times, Nebuchadnezzar and the other kings would say, um, no, you, you need to worship our gods, or, or no, you need to worship the stone idol I've raised up, or you need to do whatever. But Yahweh God remained with the people, and, and they kept talking about it, and so they always had that hope to keep them going, and in the end, Cyrus sends them back, and uh, they they reestablish their their kingdom, and ne- never really do get back to the religious kingdom that they were, um, but they do establish the kingdom. But see, at that point, they've forgotten. Yes, sir. Okay. Billy Graham. Romania allowed Billy Graham into the country. So the leader of Romania thought nobody would show up because religion had been wiped out and the stadium was overflowing. And and I think that's it. Even in Russia, you know, with the fall of communism, what happened with the churches? All of a sudden, these little pockets that had been in quiet or or had been in hiding pop up and they're they're no longer in hiding. Now they're allowed to worship again, you know? And the churches get uh, reorganized. Of course, most of the churches had been claimed by the government. Uh, one church was turned into a swimming pool. I think I read somewhere. They actually took the floor out and made it a swimming pool. Turned them into warehouses. Turn, well, at least a warehouse, you clean the stuff out and you can have your church back. If you turn it into a swimming pool, how do you turn that back into a church? I guess it could be a church that has a very big baptistry.
Right. Right. Well, and see, the Pope really, see, and, and here's the thing, the Russians really aren't Catholic. They're Russian Orthodox. But, uh, and see, the or Right. Yeah, it is. And, I mean, but... They're both, they're both Eastern Orthodox. Yeah, which I, I don't know how, how that works, you know. You know, Pope, you, you, you're not, you, for centuries you haven't been welcomed there because the Eastern Orthodox broke away and they have their own uh, leaders. And so now, yeah, but it, it, yeah, it can be seen as somewhat religious. There is a religious aspect to the war. Um, there, there's so much about this war that doesn't make sense. There's just so much about this war that doesn't make sense, and it's kind of like, why, why are we going down this road again? You know, didn't we settle that argument back in the, the 40s? You know, why do we have to go back down this again? Well, we settled it, but then we reopened it in the, the around 2000 when the wall fell, and Okay, so I'm going to rephrase what you said. So are we being religious or are we claiming to be religious? And I, and I think, there, uh, by the way, I have a book in my, my library that goes back to the 70s, How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious. And basically it's how do you believe in God without going to church is base, the basic premise. So... When we look at people today, and, and again, this ties into why we need this reminder. You know, what, what, does, what does this book say about how I live my life? Where my hope is, where my joy is, what tells me what's right and wrong, you know, all of that kind of stuff. There are many people who claim to be Christian, and, and by the way, what, what's it take to be Christian? How many, how many verses out of here do you have to memorize? None. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. So, I mean, you could, you could not even know this book exists and still be a Christian because somebody told you about Jesus. So, it's not about whether you memorized the book or not. However, and I'm going to say this and I'll probably get beat over the head with it, you don't have to memorize the Bible to be a Christian, but because you're a Christian, you should memorize the Bible. Because you want that in your life. You, you, you want to walk with Jesus, and you want Jesus beside you. Um, and far too many people today, they, they take this book, and they'll cut huge sections out of this book because it, it doesn't fit their idea of what religion's all about. And so they'll say, well, you know, I accept, I accept these 139 verses from the New Testament that I believe are really true. Okay, uh, how do you come to that conclusion? Well, it just, as I read them, I get such a good feeling about God being with me and stuff. So I think that those are the words that really count in the New Testament. Other things, they, they just don't really, they, they don't mean as much. They, they were written for that time, and they don't, they don't count now. What do you think of that? I think if you call into question one word, you call into question all of it, right? 
Is this God's word or not? And there's your major difference. In the 70s, you have the historical critical method, which you don't have to know the whole historical critical method, but it was, a, it was critical of the Bible. It criticized the Bible or it critiqued the Bible based on history. And so it said, well, when you look at the Old Testament, this section of the Old Testament is just fairy tales. And they were used to scare the people so that they would do what God wanted them to do. And, and this, part, this part is all about the temple. And see, the temple could exercise a lot of control, and so the priests put that section in just so that they would have control over the people's lives. But see, God didn't really want that there. The problem with it is, pretty soon you have a Bible that's so full of holes that it's not a Bible at all. You know, it's like trying to, to cook a can of soup in a sieve. You know, the screen or colander. You put that on the stove, you pour your can of soup in. I mean, how much soup are you going to have? It's tomato soup, by the way. I, you don't have to like tomato soup. But what's going to happen when you pour tomato soup in a sieve? It's all going to run through. It's going to be all over the stove, and it's not going to be in your tummy, right? When you start punching holes in God's word, you're losing your hope. And Peter doesn't want that to happen. Peter wants you to be reminded of that. Um, but yes, we have many people that claim to be religious when they're not. Um, and, I, and I do have to go back to, it's not about how much of the Bible that you've memorized. It's do you know Jesus? And do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Master? Are you willing to listen to his word for your life and, accept, and, and, and follow that word? Um, and I, it is my fervent, I, I sin every day, every, all of us do, but it is my fervent word that I never preach a word contrary to what is in this book. And that I never propose to do something as a church that goes in contradiction to what is in this book. But rather to use this book to remind people of the hopes and the promises that God has given. Um, and there's much going on in the world today that seeks to destroy that word because, again, if, you, if, if I'm taking hope from this book, I'm not looking to the, the hope that the world holds out. I've got my hope. And my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And by the way, one of my favorite hymns. One of. I've got many, but one of them. Um, and you just, you, I mean, if, you, if you're hoping on something else, you, you're going to fall. Um. But why do we need to be reminded? I think this whole discussion is why we need to be reminded of what Scripture is all about. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you know Moses and the prophets. These are they that testify about me or testify concerning me. The whole purpose of the Old Testament is to point forward to Jesus, to point to God's love story with the Israel, Israeli people, the descendants of Abraham, uh, in order for Jesus to come and fulfill the first covenant. You can take whatever else you want out of the Old Testament. But if you're not seeing that thread of God's love flowing through all the bad and all the difficult, then we have a problem. Um, and by the way, uh, okay, so I'm going I'm to turn this conversation a little bit. How many of you like a, a good steak? So I'm going to take all of the steak in all of the world and I'm going to put it in the grinder and I'm going to grind it up. And I'm, I'm going to make it into hamburgers. How many of you still like your steak? I, I like a good steak burger, but do I like it as well as seeing that steak sitting there? 
Now, I'm going to go one step further. How many of you like a McDonald's hamburger? Oh, you've got a couple. I can't. I, I, fast food burgers just don't do it anymore. Um, the closest I come to fast food is Five Guys, Portillo's. You know, those are fast food restaurants, but they got better hamburgers. Um, I just can't, I can't hardly stand the, the hamburgers anymore. I used to love a Big Mac or a Whopper or something like that. I just can't, I can't hardly take it anymore. <laughs> I had an uncle that lived in Virginia outside of Washington, D.C. Worked at, he was a, a custodian at the Pentagon. And every summer, he and my aunt would come to visit my grandmother, who lived downstairs from us. And Uncle Fred would drive his Lincoln Continental Town Car. It's the only person I knew that had a Lincoln Continental Town Car. And he had had it converted to where he could burn gasoline and propane. I mean, extra special. And he would come, and all of a sudden, 11 and 11.30, he would disappear. About a mile from where Grandma and us lived, there was a white castle. And he'd pull his Lincoln Continental up there, and he'd walk in, and he'd say, I need 50 white castles, I need 10 fries, I need, and he'd... He'd bring these boxes home, and we would sit out in the yard eating White Castles. I can't, I, 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 I love White Castles. White Castles does not love me anymore. So, uh, and by the way, the, the whole point of it was, and I was going to get there eventually, um, how many of you want to, how many of you would like living a, a diet of steak? You, want, you don't, wouldn't want to eat steak all the time? I would. I'd love it. I could do that. Um, how many of you want to live a White Castle diet where breakfast, lunch, and supper you eat White Castle? What's the point? Garbage in, garbage out. Good food in, good out, right? And so what Peter's basically saying is watch what you're putting in you. Because where your hope is found tells something about you. And so if you lose that word of God, you lose that hope. That nutrition is not there. And by the way, White Castles, McDonald's, Burger King are not the most nutritious in the world. I'm sorry to say it. Um, as much as I used to like going by and getting my three double cheeseburgers at White Castles, it's not very nutritious. And I'm probably going to get in trouble for that. I have used entirely too many name brands in my lesson today, and probably it is going to be censored at some point in time. Why, why does Peter refer to his body as a tent? How many of you live in a tent? How many of you live in a tent? What's the significance of the tent? When you go camping, do you figure you're going to stay in that tent forever? Or is it just a temporary thing? It's for a time. God wants us to think of this body not as our permanent residence, but as a dwelling for a time. Peter refers to it, by the way, it is a double meaning, but first of all, Peter refers to it as a tent because it is temporary. It's not our permanent dwelling. And we go to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 4. We know, this is Paul speaking. Paul talks about the tent also. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. You know, see the, the temporary nature. If, if you value, if what is valuable to you is this, or what you hold in your hand, it's going to take away from what's truly valuable for you, that heavenly kingdom. Um, people will say, so what are we going to look like when we're in heaven? And I'll say, I don't know. So here's my puzzle. My Aunt Esther died when she was like four years old. So she only knew my grandmother as a young lady. And now, by the way, Grandma had like seven kids after Aunt Esther. Um, she had 11 total. So she had a lot of kids. My my. Brother-in-law Phil came into the family late. Phil only knew grandmother as an old lady. And I, by the way, I say old lady in the most loving of ways. I, that, that old gal was the grand old gal. She almost 101 when she died. I, I'd love to sit down and talk to her again about her life and everything she went through. So I'm not saying old in a bad way. But Phil only knew her as an old lady. I count that my Aunt Esther is in heaven, and I count that my brother-in-law Phil will eventually be in heaven, and, I, and my grandmother is in heaven. And if they should meet on the street, what's Grandma going to look like? If she's an old lady... Aunt Esther's probably not going to know her. If she's a young lady, Phil might not know her. So what's she going to look like? Everybody in the, you, you people out there, you, I ought to turn a camera on, you can see the puzzled look on these people's faces. It's like, <laughs> we're going to have names. Look like what? Look like Brad Pitt? Okay. Um, yeah. We, right, we, we anthropomorphize, we, we, we make him look like a man, and he doesn't. He's not a man. He is God. He is a spiritual being. He doesn't have physical arms and legs and feet and hands and face. He is a spirit. But we, ha we make him into our image. What I finally come down to on Grandma is that when we get, what? We'll recognize her spirit. But see, Jesus tells us we're going to have a new body. So we're going to actually have a body in heaven. But what that body will be will not, has not been revealed. So what I have figured out, my smart little pea brain did some thinking one evening, um, is that it's going to be one of those images where, or one of those things where whatever I need to see in that person is what I'm going to see. So Phil will see grandmother as an old lady. And Anna Esther will see her as a young lady. And she'll be grandma, our mom, to Aunt Esther. But she'll be my grandma. And she'll appear how she needs to appear to that person. I don't know where I come up with that. So don't, don't ask me for a Bible quote. But it's the only way I can get, wrap my head around the, the difficult uh, quandary that I, I put for myself. What? You're not, you're not an angel.
Hey, hey, Lord, you saw you saw the conversation that just went on in that office, right? You did see that, right? I my suggestion would be my suggestion would be give her wings. Just just follow my suggestion. Just give her wings. Uh, I I don't know if we'll have wings or not. We will not be angels. Angels are created beings. But we don't go to heaven and become an angel. And in fact, Jesus says, we see things that angels can only long to see. So, I mean, we are so much above angels that we would actually have to take a demotion if we went to heaven and became angels. Think about that. Yeah, we, we, put, we put angels up on this level and it's like, oh, they're such, such great beings, but Jesus says you're even greater. We will be. He was made a little lower than angels. So, yes, that humanity puts us lower than at this point in time. But at the moment of our death, we're immediately above what an angel would be. So why would you want to take that? You know, if, if, you, were, if you had been a captain in the army and... Uh, you, you had retired and a war broke out and they called you back in and said, we need you, Captain, we need you back in the Army. And you said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sign back up. And they said, well, okay, Private, how would you feel? No, I'm going to be at least major if you're calling me back in. You know, you're going to give me a promotion, not a demotion, right? Um, Especially from enlisted to, to the non, non-coms, but uh, or is it from the, yeah, from the commission to the non-commission. But when we look at that, you know, we have inside of us things that angels will never understand. Angels see Jesus as He is, the co-creator. Uh, equal with God and, and the, uh, the redeemer of the world, but they don't need that redemption. And in fact, the fallen angels can't even be redeemed. You know, I've often puzzled on that one. Why can't Satan and the fallen angels listen to the gospel and be redeemed? But they can't. And it's just kind of like, Yeah, we, we have such an elevated view of angels. You're right. And so we long to be them. But in reality, we are created for so much more than. And, and it's like I said, why would you want to go back into the army as a private when you were a captain or a general? You know? I, I still remember that movie, uh, White Christmas. How many of you love watching White Christmas? You know, and they, they go up to the, the inn in Vermont and they're walking in and who should walk in but the general. <gasps> you know, yeah, that's okay. People around here, general doesn't mean anything. You know, and I guess after World War II there was a lot of that, that generals went back to public society and there was nothing. But you see, the thing is, we are so much more than that. Uh, angels can only do what God tells them to do. They're given missions to do, and they do those. They're not given a free will. We are. An angel doing what God tells it to do does not bring glory to God. But when we listen to the word of God and we walk along with that word, we give glory and honor to God. You see, it, it puts us so much above that. 
And that's why we need to look at this body as a temporary dwelling. This is not what we're going to be, folks. It's only for a time. Now, I said this was a double, uh, had a double meaning. When the Israelites or the Jewish people would see the word tent or hear the word tent, what would they think of? Forty years in the desert? The tabernacle. You're both right. Forty years in the desert, following after that tent. By the way, the other name for the tabernacle is the... T of M. The T of M. The tabernacle was the tent of meeting. It was where you went to see God. So tent becomes a very intense intentionally, word for the Israelites because the image that immediately comes in is it's the place I meet God, right? The whole purpose of that tabernacle was God dwells within us. When we look at our body and the tent that we are in, God meets us here. God does not, and Peter understands this, God does not ask us to climb a mountain and sit on a rock and hope that we get a vision of him. Like the Indian religions, you know, uh, they would go on their spirit quest, and they would climb up this mountain, and they would sit there, probably smoking some wacky weed or something like that, but they would wait until they had their vision, and then they would be a spirit warrior. God doesn't ask us to do that. God doesn't ask us to solve great puzzles. God does it all. And so when we look at this tent of meeting, he meets us exactly as we are. When, okay, I'm going to throw something out to you. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. I'm not going to tell you if I truly believe this or not until after, okay? So in that whole Jesus meeting them on the beach, Jesus says to them, Uh, Throw out your nets on the right side of the boat. And they do, and they catch a great number of fish. John says to Peter, it's the Lord. Peter throws his clothes on, jumps in, swims to shore to meet Jesus. Sees fish and bread there. The boat comes in. He grabs the, the net, brings it over to Jesus when Jesus says, bring me some fish. He brings it over to Jesus. And because he listens to Jesus and he, and he comes swimming in, Jesus then reinstates him. Yes or no? You see, that's it exactly. Peter could have stayed in the boat and, and just brought the fish in and, and sat in the boat, kind of like, I'm scared, Lord. And Jesus would have still called him out of the boat and said, let's go for a walk. And by the way, if you read John, it doesn't say that they went for a walk on the beach. It says after breakfast, he's asking these questions. Right? Then Peter looks behind him and sees John. We just, we just assume that they're moseying on down the beach, right? But Jesus asked him the questions, not because Peter had done anything to earn a second chance. but because Jesus had given him the second chance. Jesus met Peter in that failed, flawed, ripped tent that he lived in, that tent of denial. And he drew that denial out of him with a triple confession so that Peter could continue in service to him. But he met Peter where Peter was. Why is that important for us? When Peter talks about that tent, he understands. He wants everybody to understand that 
when God comes to meet us, he doesn't ask us for great things in order to come and meet us. He comes to bring us great things. Um, I, I have a story that I often use in my Advent series, and it's about a lady, a lady whose son went to, uh, went to war, World War II, and, uh, and died over in World War II. And many years later, she received this important-looking letter in the mail. And she opened the letter, and there, in beautiful gold script, is this announcement that the ambassador of this country in Europe was coming to see her and to have Christmas with her. And she's all in a frenzy. Oh, my, my house is so shabby. My curtains, they, I, haven't, I haven't bought new curtains in, in eons. My carpets, they've got holes in them, my, my furniture. And, and so she sets about redoing her whole house for this diplomat that is coming to make ready for him. And the day comes, and she's nervously standing there at the door, waiting, and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door, and she opens the door, and there's this very important-looking gentleman standing there with people behind him, and she says, please, please, come into my house. I hope it is suitable for you. The man walks in, and he looks around, and he says, it's not like John describes it. And she said, John, he said, yes. I knew your son in the war. I'm here today because of him. He saved my life. And I remember the stories he told about how beautiful the house was at Christmas. He described it in great detail. And I wanted to see it. She had been so concerned about looking right and being right for this important person that she missed the point of his meeting or of his coming. And God doesn't ask us to memorize this book so that he'll come and see us. God doesn't ask us to keep the Ten Commandments so that we can be worthy of him. God doesn't ask us to patch up the holes in our tent or put a new tent up. God asks us to be us. And when he knocks on the door, to open it, to accept him in. Because his son has told him all about us. He wants to be with us. Um, and so when we look at that tent, we again, it's a temporary dwelling. We have such a greater being that we're going to be. Our permanent dwelling is in heaven with him. But while we're here, he is not ashamed to meet us in this poor tent. But rather, he comes freely and willingly to meet us so we might be with him. I think that's what Peter's point is. It, don't, don't value what you have here. Value what God has in store for you there. And, and it's a lesson we need to learn. Um, doing some serious looking at things I have and whether I need them or not. And are they, are they helps or hindrances? And I think we need to 
ask ourselves. If all these things were gone, would we be less than what we are? Or will we perhaps be more? Think about that thought this week. Um, we will meet again next week. We'll continue with the second part of question eight. How does it help us to think in the same way? And that's what I'm kind of encouraging you. Look at the tent that is your tent of meeting. And as you look at that tent, What's, what's the tent all about? And are you happy to have God there? So think about that for next week, and we will uh, we'll gather together next week. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you meet us not because of things we have done or ever will be able to do, because of the things that have been done for us by our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that we may always look forward to meeting you in this tent that you have provided us with, so that in all things we might be ready for your coming and for the kingdom. Now, Heavenly Father, bless us. Help us not to value the tent, but rather the one who meets us in this tent. Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name, amen. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being with us online. And as I said, we will see you next week.